Rapid onset gender dysphoria, the backlash. Last week we discovered, discussed a paper by um, Dr. Littman called Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria in Adults, Adolescents and Young Adults, a study of parental reports from uh, PLOS One, which is a peer-reviewed journal. and. Last I checked, it's still available online. Um, I'm going to summarize the paper in my own words. First of all, it's an apologetically an observational paper with all the limits that implies and the, and the person who wrote it recognizes those limits. Secondly, it strongly suggests that rapid onset gender dysphoria exists and that it is different from the traditional gender dysphoria. Several differences. More females than males by far, whereas the old style was more males than females, etc. Um, there was some there were some strong suggestions that it is largely socially mediated, which um, obviously does not fit certain standard narratives. I think it, uh, it proves without, you know, beyond reasonable doubt that some significant attempted social conditioners encourage lying. It suggests that it actually works because according to parents' reports of what their kids said, they used the techniques that were being advocated. But maybe the parents misunderstood, maybe the parents are lying. Um, uh, what, you, what you can't argue against is that there are some people who are advocating lying. It argues that rapid onset gender dysphoria parallels anorexia nervosa. We're gonna get into a little more detail, so if you missed it last week, well, you still get some idea, but, um, uh, and it finally argues that along with anorexia nervosa, at least some rapid onset gender dysphoria is dysfunctional. Now does it prove that all of it is? No. Does it even say that all of it is? No but it suggests that there can be a parallel. Um, this paper got advertised in uh, News from Brown, which is the Brown University online paper, um, in an article that says Brown researcher first to describe rapid onset gender dys dysphoria. Since the work was done at Brown, you kind of expect them to say something about it. Rapid onset gender dysphoria might spread through groups of friends and may be a harmful coping mechanism, a new study suggests, but more research is needed. Notice new study suggests, not proves, and notice that more research is needed. Very first paragraph. Um, now, that page is no longer available. Um, I was able to get it via what's called the Wayback Machine, which is an archive that collects everything. Um, nothing disappears from the internet completely. Um, and I'm going to uh, give you the rest of the article quickly. Providence, Rhode Island. Um, uh, in Brown University is in, in, uh, in uh, offsets. For individuals with gender dysphoria, the conflict between experience, gender identity, and sex observed at birth produces significant emotional distress. Until recently, it was unusual for a teen to report initial feelings of gender dysphoria during or after puberty without childhood symptoms. They didn't want to play with trucks. They wanted to play with dolls, etc. 
Clinicians have reported that this kind of gender dysphoria is on the rise, particularly for patients whose sex was observed to be female at birth. Additionally, the numbers of adolescents seeking care for gender dysphoria has increased dramatically. It is unknown why these changes are occurring. So there's a problem. The research is going to try to solve it. This month, a Brown University researcher published the first study to empirically, that link, by the way, goes to the article that you know, uh, to empirically describe teens and young adults who did not have childhood symptoms of gender dysphoria during childhood, but who were first observed by their parents to rapidly develop gender dysphoria symptoms over days, weeks, or months during or after puberty. This kind of descriptive study is important because it defines a group and raises questions for more research, said study author Lisa Littman, an assistant professor of the practice of behavioral and social sciences at Brown School of Public Health. Um, by the way, she is a MD, OBGYN, uh, as well as her public health degree. Uh, one of the main conclusions is that more research needs to be done. Descriptive studies aren't randomized controlled trials. You can't tell cause and effect, and you can't tell prevalence. It's going to take more studies to bring in more information. But this is a start. The study was published August 16 in PLOS One. Letman surveyed more than 250 parents of children who suddenly developed gender dysphoria symptoms during or after puberty. She said she wanted to better understand the phenomenon, which seems to be on the rise, but had been considered atypical even just a few years ago. Gender dysphoria is de defined as the emotional distress a person feels because of the difference between their experienced gender identity and their sex observed at birth. Gender dysphoria is not the same as gender nonconformity or not following the stereotypes of one's, one's assigned gender. You can be a tomboy without having to be a gender dysphoric person. Um, the children of the parents surveyed were more than 80% female at birth and ranged between 11 and 27 years old at the time of the survey, with an average age of 16. Additionally, 47% of the children were reported as af academically gifted. Actually, a little more if you count the ones that were academically gifted and uh, had a disability as well. Um, over half. Um, prior to the gender dysphoria symptoms. Most of the parents, parent respondents were female, white, and U.S. residents. In the 90 question survey, Littman asked the parents about each of the eight indicators for gender dysphoria in childhood that are detailed by the American Psychiatric Association. To meet the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in childhood, a child needs, it, needs to experience at least six of the eight indicators. Most include readily observable signs, such as a strong rejection of typically feminine or masculine toys and games, and strong resistance to wearing typically feminine or masculine clothes. 80% of the parents reported observing none of these indicators in their children before puberty. They might have had gender dysphoria, but they hit it well if that's the case. Among the noteworthy patterns Littman found in the survey data, 21% of parents reported their child had one or more friends become transgender identified at around the same time. 20% reported an increase in their child's social media use around the same time as experiencing gender dysphoria symptoms. And those are a little deceptive because 45% reported both. So over half had each one, and over 80% had one of the two, if you add them together, 86 to be precise. The pattern of clusters in of teens and friend groups becoming transgender identified, the group dynamics of these friend groups, and the type of advice viewed online led her to the hypothesis that friends and online sources could spread certain beliefs. Examples include the belief that nonspecific symptoms such as feeling uncomfortable in their own skins or feeling like they didn't fit in, which could be a part of normal puberty or associated with trauma, should be perceived as gender dysphoria. The belief that the only path to happiness is transition, and the belief that anyone who disagrees with the teens is transphobic and should be cut out of their life. Of the parents who provided information about their child's friendship group, about a third responded that more than half of the kids in the friendship group became transgender identified. 
Littman said. A group with 50% of its members becoming transgender identified represents a rate that is more than 70 times the expected prevalence for young adults. Additionally, 62% of parents reported their teen or young adult had one or more diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder or neurodevelopmental disability before the onset of gender dysphoria. 48% reported that their child had experienced a traumatic or stressful event prior to the onset of their gender dysphoria, including being bullied, sexually assaulted, or having their parents get divorced. This suggests that the drive to transition expressed by these teens and young adults could be a harmful coping mechanism like drugs, alcohol, or cutting, Littman said. With harmful coping mechanisms, certain behaviors are used to avoid feeling negative emotions in the short term, but they do not solve the underlying problems and they do often cause additional problems, she noted. In other words, this could turn out, at least in some cases, to be not good. Littman added that more research is needed to determine the prevalence of rapid onset gender dysphoria, whether adolescent onset gender dysphoria and rapid onset gender dysphoria are temporary or likely to be long term, which is important if you're going to mutilate your body in order to, to fix this, um, and how to best support individuals with rapid onset gender dysphoria and their families. In addition, Littman is currently analyzing data from a survey of 100 people who experienced gender dysphoria, chose to undergo medical or surgical transition, and then detransitioned by stopping hormone treatments or having surgery to reverse the effects of transition. There's a lot that we don't know about gender dysphoria, Littman said. The cultural landscape has changed very dramatically, so it's not unexpected to see new types of presentations. It's important to determine which patients would benefit from medical and surgical transition and which patients would not benefit and might be harmed. That's the question that's being raised. What's a good idea to do for these kids? Or, well, they're kids to me now. Um, okay, and then there is, what's up there now? Uh, Brown's statement on gender dysphoria study. This is what took the place of what we just read. Following the uh, decision to remove a news story on research into rapid onset gender dysphoria, the university has issued a series of statements to the Brown community. And I'm going to, again, for legibility reasons, give you um, the text copied and pasted, or at least most of it. Um, Providence, Rhode Island, on August 22, Brown University published a news story. Let's go back. August 27, that was fast. On August 22, 2018, Brown University published a news story detailing a research article in the journal PLOS One on rapid onset gender dysphoria. On the morning of August 27, PLOS One issued a comment on the study and Brown responded by removing the news story from news distribution the same day. The university issued the statement below regarding the decision to remove the article, and due to inaccurate reporting about the nature of events, Brown on September 5 issued an expanded statement regarding its decision. So this is the expanded statement. Um, this is the original statement apparently, in light of questions raised about research design and data collection related to Lisa Littman's study on rapid under onset gender dysphoria, Brown determined that removing the article from news distribution is the most responsible course of action. As, uh, that should be italics, I'm sorry. As a general practice university, news offices often make determinations about publishing faculty research based on its publication in established peer-reviewed journals considered to be in good standing. The journal PLOS One on, uh, on the morning of August 27 published a comment on the research study by Lisa Littman, who holds the position of assistant professor of the practice of behavioral and social science at Brown, indicating that the journal will seek further expert assessment on the study's methodology and analyses. Below is the comment posted on the study in the journal PLOS One. And I'll read it here and then it'll come up later so we'll kind of skip over it so you may want to remember it. 
plus one is aware of the reader concerns raised on the study's content and methodology. We take all concerns raised about publications in the journal very seriously and are following up on these per our policy and COPE guidelines. As part of our follow-up, we will seek further expert assessment on the study's methodology and analyses. We will provide a further update once we have completed our assessment and discussions. So, basically, it was unpeer-reviewed. Expanded Brown University statement. Brown does not shy away from controversial research. The university's Office of Communications decided to publicize research on Brown's website on rapid onset gender dysphoria, recognizing the topic to be a subject of rigorous debate in the field of study. After the research paper was published in Journal PLOS One, concerns were raised about the paper's research design and methodology by leading academics in the field. These concerns were serious enough that PLOS One announced that it would conduct a post-publication re-review of the article to seek further expert assessment on the study's methodology and analyses. Given the concerns about research design and methods, not the controversial nature of the subject, yeah, right, uh, the university decided to stop featuring the news story on its news features, on its news site. Um, However, the research article is still available on the, research, on the journal's website and on the author's researchers at Brown page. The university does not know how long the re-review of the paper will take or what, if any, action the, uh, the journal will take. The university feels it important to make the following three points about this incident. One, this is not about academic freedom, as some news outlets have made it out to be. The f this faculty member, and indeed all Brown re uh, faculty members, have the right to conduct research on topics they choose. This is the case even for research that leads him into politically con controversial territory. Brown gives its full support to this faculty member to conduct her research and publish her work. I'm sure she feels that. <laughs> this is about academic standards. Brown can publicize only a small subset of the great research conducted by our faculty. As a research institution, we feel we must ensure that w the work that is featured on the university website conforms to the highest academic standards. So obviously this doesn't, so we're going to retract it, but they're not gonna say that. Given the concerns raised about research methods and uh, research design and methods, the most responsible course of action was to stop publicizing the work published in this particular instance we would have done this regardless of the topic of the article. Mm -hmm. Academic freedom and inclusion are not mutually exclusive. This paper has attracted wide attention due to its politicized nature. Is it a politicized nature or is it a nature that is uh, goring somebody's political ox that they don't like? Brown is steadfast in conveying to people who object to the content of the research that we stand by an academic freedom and will not do anything to thwart this or any faculty member's research. At the same time, we've confirmed our long-standing support for members of the trans community. Brown is proud to be among the first universities to include medical care for gender reassignment in its student health plan. and that our medical school is a leader in education and on care for transgender individuals. Academic freedom and support for the trans community or any other group are not mutually exclusive. That depends on how you define support, obviously. These values can and indeed must coexist. Additional information, and this is the part that I think comes up later on, you saw that other one was dated for the 27th. Links to the study in PLOS One, which you've already seen, Dean's letter to the School of Public Health Community, and he gives the name of the dean and so forth. Is a female, by the way. Dear members of the public health and Brown community. Uh, skipping on, because some of this stuff will be repetitive. Um, independent of the university's removal of the article because of concerns about research methodology, See, you notice how supportive they are of her. 
Uh, the School of Public Health has heard from Brown community members expressing concerns that the conclusions of the study could be used to discredit efforts to support transgender and youth and invalidate the perspectives of members of the transgender community. You see, if you're invalidating mem uh, the perspective of members of the transgender community, that's not good. The university and school have always affirmed the importance of academic freedom and the value of rigorous debate informed by research. The merits of all research should be debated vigorously because that is the process by which knowledge ultimately advances, often through tentative findings that are often overridden or corrected in subsequent higher quality research. The spirit of free inquiry and scholarly debate is central to academic e excellence. Notice what's being done here. They're not saying, we'll leave the paper up, we'll put some notes beside it, and then we'll come back to it later. They're saying, do we really want this on our website? At the same time, we firm, believe firmly that it is also incumbent on public health researchers to listen to multiple perspectives. Um, okay and to recognize and articulate the limitations of their work. Those of you who were here last week noticed that she would recognize the limitations of her work, um, at least some of them. This process includes acknowledging and considering the perspectives of those who criticize our met research methods and conclusions and working to improve for future research to address these limitations and better serve public health. There's an added obligation for vigilance in research design and analysis any time there are implications for the health of the communities and at the center of research and study. Skipping on in an effort to support robust research and constructive dialogue on gender identity in adolescents and youth, the school will be organizing a panel of experts to present the latest research in this area and to define directions for future work to optimize health in transgender communities. Wait a minute. We support anybody doing whatever research they want to, but we're going to do a committee to make sure that the research is directed properly. Okay. We believe that more and better research is needed to help uh, guide advances in the health of the LGBTQ community. We welcome input from faculty, staff, and students about the composition of this panel and scope of the discussion. Uh, who will turn up in those meetings, I wonder? Now, the PLOS One study, I found that quote in PLOS One, okay? That is the entire paragraph, by the way, of that particular comment. Uh, if you go to the, the study and you go to comments, the very first comment is this comment here. Now, there are a couple of re replies about this comment. Um, statement by PLOS One staff, it may be useful this is somebody commenting. It may be useful to look at the history of the article, Can Some Gay Men and Lesbians Change Their Sexual Orientation? by Robert Spitzer and published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, 2003. Um, and then they gave a link. In many ways, this is a similar study, sending a poorly designed study to a population with a vested interest in answering the questions in a specific way. This study was discredited soon after its release and was a failure of the peer review process. It shouldn't ever have been published. How dare people say things that disagree with what we believe. Now, somebody commented behind that, and this is the last of this particular uh, set of comments. Much research on change has been conducted since Spitzer's study. However, the results are clear. The work of Lisa Diamond is particularly compelling and they, uh, if you click on that link, you get into this work. And uh, the work is interesting. And what I found interesting also was that nobody came back after that comment. But anyway, there are a bunch of other comments, and some of which I think are interesting enough to read here. Um, this is obviously selected because there's no way I can read all of the comments. There's about 13 comments. One of them has zero replies and one of them has 14 replies. So um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of material there. But some of the more salient ones. 
This is the next comment, actually. Hypothesis three, rapid onset gender dysphoria is an appropriate coping mechanism for transgender children of gender critical parents. And um, I put in the competing interests declared because I think that it may be helpful in understanding what's going on. I have lived experience with the phenomenon described in the article. I'm a transgender woman. I assume that that means a man going into a woman. Member of Mad Pride Netherland and seek to end coercion in mental health care. And uh, one of the paragraphs that was interesting was, uh, does this mean that they are really transgender, the people? Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but they're not going to find out until they try. Does this mean it will solve all their mental health problems? Probably not, but it is a start and probably the first solution that addresses the underlying problem. Does it mean they're growing up? Definitely. What should you do if you doubt that they're transgender? Now that, notice, if you, not, not if you think they're wrong, but just if you doubt that they're transgender. Well, apologize. How dare you have even thought that I might be wrong. I might be mistaken. Um, and show them that they're, they're deserving of your love and care regardless of their interest or how they identify. Well, that part I could agree with. That will fulfill their need for being loved and cared for and indeed, if they're indeed not transgender, this would remove the reasons they have for pursuing transition. Maybe. This gender affirmative approach has already been tried and proven effective, especially in cases where the child turned out not to be transgender. You gotta pretend that, they're, that they've got it straight. Even if you have doubts, apologize and don't say a word because otherwise you're not being nice to them. Comments about your method and rationale. This is another section. I put the headline so that you can, if you want to go back, you can find these comments. In the conclusion section of your paper, you state the following. When AYAs diagnose their own symptoms based on what they read on the internet and hear from their friends, it is quite possible for them to reach incorrect conclusions. I agree with this. Oh, all the information that we gather from social networks, websites, and forums on the internet should be treated with extreme care and we should be skeptical about the quality of it, especially if it comes from anonymous individuals who could have their own, possibly hidden, agendas. However, this is all one paragraph, you did complete the complete opposite. You decide that only three online forums and communities provide enough and reliable information and not, not only of their participants, which is already a big leaf of faith, but also about their relatives. What makes you think that the information, comments, or the answers of these people on your survey are more reliable than the post and information of other online communities like Reddit or Tumblr? I have the impression that what you did in your paper is exactly what you recommend people not to do. You're assuming at least the existence of a medical condition on a very specific population, trusting completely on information from anonymous individuals from the internet. I think that's actually a salient criticism. Um, you know, whether it will account for everything that is in the paper is, in my opinion, a stretch, but, but it, that is actually a valid criticism. Um, let's see, back. There. And this one is methodology question. Fourth wave now should never have been sourced. That's one of the three site, uh, websites. This site is compo comprised of parents who desperately want to prove that gender dysphoria is an expression of sexual orientation. On information and belief, it was started by someone with an, a religious objection, which automatically makes it invalid, I guess. Many of the postings are from one person with multiple personalities, which could be the case with completed docs. I would love to see the reference behind that, but none is given. However, I will have to say that it, it's a valid charge assuming 
that um, uh, that it fits with uh, with the actual data that we have. Um, re regarding comments about your method and rationale, you might be correct. One interesting thing is that fourth wave now site Litman chose for recruitment tags all of its stories as HT. Uh, anyway, um, I'll ha I'll go over that in a little while. Yes, there's a bit of an echo chamber there, and parents who feel victimized by their adult children coming out as LGBT and such views might lend themselves to conspiratorial views. Another quick look through Fourth Wave Now shows quite a few stories that claim being trans is somehow uh, something created or perpetuated by Big Pharma. Um, it's not very different from the world you see in InfoWars. It's a associated with Alex Jones and the, uh, the extreme right. Um, be interesting, uh, how, many of the, how many of those stories? Quite a few, is that one, two, five, out of how many? Um, but the person who's making the comments just throws it out and expects you to take it at face value. There's a reason why I don't take it at face value, and you'll see that in a minute. This study is perfectly acceptable. Act activists may have other, motion, uh, other motivations for trying to suppress it. If your only evidence comes from polling relatives on diehard anti-LGBT sites, then not only are there anecdotes, but anecdotes probably been driven by politics. Politics? Uh, about feelings about one's young. This is not proof of the new disease Littman claims to have found. It's just proof the diehard religious right partisans, diehard religious right, okay, think LGD, LGBT recruit kids. The findings should have been stated as such instead of claiming the discovery of some spectacular new disease when there's no actual descriptive data regarding the purported art LGD patients. Um, Another comment, uh, this one is in regard to this study's perfectly acceptable activists may have other motivations for trying to suppress it. Perhaps you don't think anything is wrong with those websites habitually using slurs for most of their posts or plugging in religious right political campaigns. Your post has not been a defense of the study methods itself. Instead, you're trying to convince me that trans is morally wrong in your eyes and using insulting terms such as transgenderism and trans machine, akin to the trans cult Littman surveyed website threw around with everything. Words I've only seen on the likes of Alex Jones pages. Again, religious right, Alex Jones, keep that in mind. And we're gonna come back to that trans cult that's uh, that, that link, which we're going to go to. Methodology questions, critiques, why no verification with alleged ROGD cases and their clinicians are politically radical family members' reliable sources. So the, the criticism is that parents were conservatives who had LGBT children now and didn't like it and are trying desperately to figure out something. Um, likewise, any credible reviewers and editors would have shown similar scrutiny. scrutiny. Going by the comments of the Journal of Ado Adolescent Health in Twitter, Dr. Littman previously submitted this study in their journal. However, it was rejected likely because of the gross overreach in claims. Okay, keep that in mind. The accusation has been made that this paper was submitted elsewhere and was dumped and then PLOS One took, pick it, picked it up. Okay. Continuing that, uh, uh, continu continuing um, that same uh, part, if your only evidence comes from polling relatives on diehard anti-LGBT sites, then not only are they anecdotes, but anecdotes probably driven by politics. This is not proof of the new disease Littman claims to have found. It's just proof that diehard religious right partisans think LGBT recruit kids, and the findings should have been stated as such instead of claiming the discovery of some spectacular new, new disease. Ah, you know what, I think I read that. Um, if PLOS One, continuing on, I, I thought I had 
taken out the duplicate and obviously I hadn't. If PLOS One continues to publish studies like this, which, have, which make spectacular claims, but upon closer inspection have remarkably thin evidence, then the journal might come to be known as a repository for badly flawed studies that can't get published elsewhere. In other words, if you don't fix this, your journal is toast. I'd be shy to have my work next to this study, provided it isn't corrected. And I doubt I'm alone. Submissions to PLOS One and its impact factor have collapsed from their peak. Nice little journal you have there. Be a shame if anything happened to it. No doubt in part because of PLOS One's string of flawed studies, which is continued by Littmans, is increasingly driven by those who can pick journals with reputations for more rigor. Now, the first thing that I'm going to go to is some of the replies to some of those criticisms. It is not true that Littmann submitted this paper to another journal and was rejected. As someone who provided feedback throughout the drafting and submission process, I can attest that this important paper was submitted not only to this journal, it was never rejected from any other publication. When I see that, I begin to realize that the people who are making the complaints better be checked out because not everything they say is true. Um, oh, but I just implied it. Well, yeah, but implying it is, you know, that means that every implication has to be checked out. That means that they really need their references. Um, by the way, after this, there was a big argument. It, it's interesting to read, but I won't go through the whole thing. Um, uh, immediately, it was switched, well, well, why weren't you an author? You're writing a ghost author. When she was credited as somebody who uh, helped with the paper. So, and in other words, uh, these people are looking for things to criticize and, and overreach at times. Regarding this study is perfectly acceptable, uh, Jane Noriega, this is somebody else, you didn't read the tables nor the total of Lisa Littman's journal article. Consider this from her survey. Parents' attitude on allowing gay and lesbian couples to marry legally. Favor 220. Oppose 19. Don't know 17. 220 out of 256. What is that? Uh, it's a significant fraction. Uh, parents' belief that transgender people deserve the same right and protections as others. Yes, 225, no, 8, don't know, 20. And actually, even higher percentage. Um, somehow, I don't think that that's what you would get on Alex Jones' website. Other two. Um, baseline characteristics, table one, included that the vast majority of parentals, parents favor gay and lesbian couples' right to legally marry and believe that transgender individuals deserve the same rights and protections as other individuals in the country. Again, that's not what I would expect from Alex Jones. Are, and these parents are anti-gay, homophobic, and die-hard religious right partisans? That would be a no. Um, that comment is repeated once again in, in another setting. I agree that the study population is a specific population. This, this by the way, is Lisa Littman's rep reply to the methodology question. And they may have unique characteristics. This is, also, this is true also of Dr. Christina Olson's work on social transition of young children, parents who are attending gender conferences, having their kids as, attend gender expansive camps, and have allowed their children to socially transition before this was common, may also have unique characteristics. Both of these studies are first descriptive studies and both areas will greatly benefit from follow-up studies with recruitment from a wider selection of sources. Um, you see, in the minds of the activists, Christina Olson's work is fine because it goes where we want to go. This is not fine. 
not because the methodology is different, but because it goes in a direction we don't want to go. Regarding methodology questions and so forth, uh, some a comment was made that parental reporting is a long accepted way of gathering minor children's medical history. And it goes on to say, including some of the studies on suicide that gender trans, uh, transgender people uh, uh, rely on in their documentation of how suicide is, is a common thing in transgender people. Um, regarding the medical risk of gender from therapy, one must view Dr. Littman's study. Remember uh, that you know the claim is that this will cause damage to the transgender community. But there are problems on the other side in the light of significant medical harms that occur in, to children, adolescents, and young adults in the gender affirmative care model. Sterility in, induced by puberty blockade followed by indefinite high dose cross sex hormones and potential gonadectomy. And that's uh, A and B are references. They can't do one and two because they're already using one in their table. Documented exceedingly low rates of fertility preservation. As you go this way, you're not going to have kids. Five times elevated risk of venous thromboembolic disease for male to female due to estrogen. You could kill yourself. Elevated risk of myocardial infarction and death due to cardiovascular risks in males and females because of cross-sex hormones. Reference. Permanent sexual dysfunction caused by early puberty blockage followed by cross-sex hormones. Impairment of proper bone mineralization caused by puberty blockades with gonadin uh, releasing hormone agonists or similar medications. Impairment of normal pel uh, pelvic bone development depending on, dependent on estrogen for females receiving puberty blockers and testosterone. This has negative health implications with risk to mother and baby for future pregnancy and delivery. In other words, you're turning people into people who will automatically have to have C-sections. Hirsutism induced in females by taking superphysiologic doses of testosterone, which will be very difficult to reverse. You better like it if you're going to grow a beard because once you do, you're stuck. Gynecomastia induced in males by taking superphysiologic doses of estrogen will in most cases not be reversible except by surgery. If you ever decide you don't want it, you're going to have to cut it out. The existence of detransitioners who regret their medicalization under GAC and live with permanent negative health consequences above. There are harms. Are they worth it? That's a, that's a different question. But the idea that they just do it because it doesn't really, uh, there's no, no real uh, drawbacks is false. It is therefore imperative that a proper diagnosis be made of the true trans person in order to ensure that people are not harmed by these very powerful therapies and life altering surgical procedures. Interestingly enough, Johns Hopkins quit doing them. It was one of the pioneers. Um, now, remember that, way, uh, that uh, website? What they referred to was something called fourthwavenow.com, page one, search trans cult. If you go to fourth wave now, there's a search function and you can search for trans cult and they got a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm going to read the sidebar in just a minute, but what I'm going to tell you is that most of it pulls up trans culture. That the idea that this is all trans cult and they're tagging all of their stuff that way, that was um, a misrepresentation. Hopefully inadvertent, but that's why I say you need to check out everything. They didn't tag their stuff trans cult. Everything that was trans culture got tagged. Now, maybe trans culture is now a slur word. I think what happens is it's a slur word if somebody else is using it 
it's not a slur if the trans culture people use it because. Kind of reminds you a little bit of the N-word. Um, this is a supportive place for parents and others concerned about medical transition of minors and young adults. Many fourth wave now contributors are parents of young people who experience rapid onset gender dysphoria at adolescence, sometimes called ROGD. We recognize that in some rare cases, particularly of children who have an early onset of gender dysphoria, medical trans, no, notice, particularly with early onset, but not necessarily um, having to be gender onset or, or young onset. Um, medical transition may be the path they ultimately choose. However, we also recognize that statistically early onset cases will most likely grow up to be lesbian or gay adults. We encourage parents to consider the possibility that their gender atypical teams may not be in the wrong body, but instead may be same sex attracted and struggling with their orientation. Now that's how they view things. Um, note, tolerance is valued here. Commenter opinions span the political spectrum. We recognize that all parents of trans-identified youth from left, right, or center need a place to talk openly. Sounds like Alex Jones, doesn't it? Um, comment policy. Comments are moderated. We don't guarantee that a submitted comment will be posted. We don't publish comments which spread suicide contagion and or misleading information about suicidality. So that's one thing they're going to censor, and they tell you up front. The purpose of this site is to give voice to an alternative to the dominant trans activist and medical paradigm currently being touted by the media. Preference is given to commenters who are also gender skeptical, though respectful questions, comments countering this view will be considered. Please keep your remarks on the topic and free of religious dogma of any kind. That really sounds like Alex Jones. There is an article in Science Magazine that um, does a pretty good job of presenting this in what I would consider a balanced view. And it starts out, new paper invites a night storm over whether teens experience rapid onset of transgender identity, um, August 30th by Meredith Wadman. Controversy is exploding about a paper, of course that's the link, published this early in, uh, th earlier this month in PLOS One by a public health expert at Brown University, describing reports by parents that their children suddenly d experienced unease with the gender they were assigned at birth. The paper calls the condition raps uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, and I'm not gonna read the whole paper either, but uh, transgender advocates, it's they, and that's why I have the ellipse there, say the paper has serious methodological flaws, noting that Littman interviewed only parents, not the young people themselves, and recruited from websites frequented by parents who were concerned about their children's apparently sudden gender transitions. Meanwhile, the reactions of Brown and the journal are being assailed by critics who accuse them of caving to political pressure. On Monday, PLOS One announced it is conducting a post-publication investigation of the study's methodolo methodology and analysis. Also on Monday, Brown officials removed the university's press release. They were fast. F highlighting the paper from its website. On Tuesday, Beth Marcus, dean of Brown School of Public Health, added that people in the Brown community have raised concerns that the public's conclusions could be used to discredit the effort to support transgender youth and evaluate the, invalidate the perspectives of members of the transgender community. We read that. The actions by the journal and the university have infuriated some researchers who say the moves trample academic freedom. This is a sad day for Je Brown University and an indictment of the integrity of their academic and administrative leadership. Jeffrey Flyer, former dean of the Harvard Medical School and still practicing there, tweeted on Monday. In an interview with Science Insider, he called elements of Marcus' statement anti-intellectual and completely antithetical to academic freedom, and he said he, he found it horrifying that Brown failed to defend Littman. A petition urging Brown and PLOS One to resist ideologically based attempts to squelch controversial research evidence was gathering 80 signatures per hour on Wednesday. 
ROGD's existence is furiously disputed by transgender activists. They argue that what may seem rapid onset to parents is likely the result of a lengthy internal process in children. That's the essence of that second comment that I read a uh, piece of. What's rapid about ROGD parents is, uh, is parents' sudden awareness and assessment of the child's gender dysphoria. The Oakland, California-based transgender writer and former developmental biologist Julie Serrano wrote in a critical essay last week. She argues that Littman's paper provides no evidence for the existence of ROGD. I just, no evidence. I mean, I could see it doesn't prove, but no evidence? I would have rejected this manuscript outright for its methodological flaws and also its bias, said Jayan Aaron Saft, Director of Mental Health at the Child and Adolescent Gender Care Center at the University of California, San Francisco's Benioff Children's Hospital, who treats trans transgender young people as a clinical psychologist and re has reviewed scientific papers for journals. Its implications that gender exploration is simply a fad whipped up by peer influence. Is that really the charge? No, it's saying that some of it could be. Should not be taken as authentic. I'm not sure what authentic means in that s section. Uh, she argues it negates the experience of many transgender youth. But Leray Blanchard, a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto in Canada who worked for 15 years in a gender identity clinic that screened candidates for sex reassignment surgery, said the says the paper points to a clear phenomenon, a new subgroup of adolescents, mainly women, with gender dysphoria and no behavioral signs of such dysphoria during childhood. Many clinicians in North America and elsewhere have been seeing such patients, Blanchard wrote in an email. So apparently it does exist. Why would one say it can't exist if one doesn't have an agenda? In the study, Littman acknowledged its limitations, described it as a starting point. Like all first descriptive studies, additional studies will be needed to replicate the findings, she wrote. She told Science Insider that in upcoming research, she plans to recruit parent-teen pairs in cases where the teenager experienced ROGD that later resolved. Um, and then finally, where I ran into it, is an article by David Klinghoffer, expressing science at uh, Brown University, and that was from Evolution News. And I'm not gonna read most of the article because we've already been through all of the issues, but I'm going to get to one point that he makes that isn't made elsewhere. Dreadfully familiar, this is all dreadfully familiar to scientists who favor critiques of Darwinian theory and arguments for intelligent design. They have seen what happened to researchers who, perhaps naively, went public with their own reflections on the evidence for teleology in nature and biology. You'll find some of these stories at the Free Science website. Skipping on, Professor Flyer says this business with Dr. Littman's paper in PLOS One is without parallel in all my years in academia. That's funny. I can think of a very close comparison. Just a couple of years ago, the very same journal caved in response to a different mob of enraged activists after PLOS One published another peer-reviewed paper, this one by Chinese researchers, on the human hand and noting its proper design by the creator to perform a multitude of daily tasks in a comfortable way. We covered this, if you wanna go back to the, uh, the video in um, No Creator Need Apply. And uh, now my take is the paper seems quite reasonable as long as one assumes the basic honesty of the respondents. It could be used to invalidate the perspectives or at least some of the perspectives of some of the trans community. The most important perspective being invalidated is that one must always believe the subject who insists that he or she or whatever pronoun this person is using is trans. Calling someone a liar is almost always, at least in the short term, hurtful. Saying someone is mistaken can often be experienced by that person as hurtful. Um, saying nothing or agreeing when one's better judgment disagrees with someone may also be hurtful in the long run. And the question is, which hurt is worse? 
the truth matters. I am troubled by two aspects of the controversy. Number one, some con uh, commenters on websites seem to encourage deception to reach a goal regarding treatment. We covered that last week. And number two, some commenters on the article's website seem to make sloppy arguments and make unsubstantiated charges. I do think that Littman's paper suffers from the weakness that the parent's perspective may not reflect all of reality in many of these reported cases. It would have been nice to have gone through two or three just to get the kids' perspective and see whether the kids agreed with the parents, because especially the kids that later transition back, because that would, be, that would at least give you some validation of the fact that it isn't just the parents. However, the parent's perspective is at least partially validated if the adult or young adult, uh, adolescent or young adult later changes to a transgender identity and the AYA perspective cannot be taken uncritically when the AIA has been encouraged to lie and especially when some AYAs apparently boast about lying. Now maybe the parents are lying about that too but somehow I don't think all the lying is done on one side. But taking the AYA perspective uncritically seems to be precisely what is demanded. Now, I can't do that. Remember, I don't do that in any other area, including the area of scriptural authority. In fact, these people often insist that I must not do that with scriptural authority. Well, if that's the case, why should they be different? So I think you have to take claims with a grain of salt. And I think a paper saying so is reasonable. The paper should stand. If there are defects, further papers should present arguments pointing out the defects and or gather further data refuting the paper in these areas. That's the way science should be done. You don't silence people. You allow them to speak and then you show where they're wrong. The idea of censoring the paper after acceptance smacks of intolerance fueled by inability to refute the data and or the conclusions. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment in the back. <coughs> A couple of things I want to say um, about the paper itself. Since this is Brown University, which has an excellent reputation, I would assume they have an IRB committee. And the research would have gone through IRB before it was ever started. Uh, it is stated that it did go through IRB. And then the university needs to stand beside, behind it. And it also, I would assume that if this PLOS One, it was peer reviewed, didn't she say it was also peer reviewed? Um, uh, everybody, I think, says it was peer reviewed. The, the procedure that is being done is a re-review. One other thing, when doing uh, research in, like in education, which is my field, one of the first things you do is do a qualitative study similar to what this study is to get a broad view of the field and from that then you can begin to do other studies that are more quantitative or statistical in nature but you don't start out with the statistical and expect to come to any kind of a reasonable conclusion without there having been a qualitative component to the research. I think she's doing this exactly right. She's done the qualitative part. She can now with other colleagues continue and come up with other things. It, it appeared to me that Brown's medical component where they're doing transgender medical things by reassignment surgeries, those people may be the ones who are stepping in and criticizing because they don't want their funding to be cut. I think you may be right on that. I, when I did a study on senile dementia and diet, I picked a small area to do kind of a pilot sub-study to begin with 
to come up with criteria as to what, how we could diagnose dementia on a person's chart, which turns out to be very, very difficult uh, and probably misclassifies a few people. Uh, the way we tried to make that a little bit fair was to make all of the, uh, all of the evaluations blinded as to diet so that diet could not influence uh, our assignment of dementia or no dementia. Um, and we came pretty close to that. I think there were eight breakages in the, uh, in the study on whether they were, um, the looking at whether they were demented or not, uh, finding out in the middle or perhaps at the beginning or the end that they were really um, uh, you know, vegetarians or not, which was th what I was looking for. Um, but in order to just get the criteria, we had a small study and then we had a little larger study and the larger study was able to be published. Um, this is a, this is a collection of a new phenomenon and the first place you want to go is where the phenomenon is reported. Um, this was actually quite a good size beginning study. Yeah. And she used SurveyMonkey and I wanted to say something about SurveyMonkey last week because apparently she gave the impression that there was no funding came directly to her. But if I'm correct, I think the university has a buys a license to use SurveyMonkey for a certain period of time, and so she would have been under the auspices of the university for that as well. Uh, you're probably right about that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in any case, if there was a charge, I'm sure it was uh, nominal. Well, and it went. Because the university paid it. It was their SurveyMonkey. Yeah. Because you know, if she's funded, she's not going to throw twenty thousand dollars into this. Yeah, you know, that, that's that's not what researchers do normally, um, and that means that Brown University must have approved the Survey Monkey. Brown University approved all of this stuff. What happened was that when she suggested it, and um, it hit the activist uh, thing, they screamed bloody murder and said this this should be reviewed. It really shouldn't be in the peer-reviewed literature. There's a serious political agenda at Brown. Well, the thing of it is, the thing that's funny is that they accuse everybody else of having a political agenda. Yes. <coughs> in, a, in a very different area, uh, when you referred to it a little earlier, I would have had experience which would made me last week when I was listening to you predict exactly these kinds of responses. Uh, we, we published, uh, we tried to get published and succeeded to get a paper in which our sample sizes were like four or five times larger than anything else in the literature, which destroyed the use of the call characteristics of male crickets for attracting females in a way that kept the species separate because we showed that females of any one species would go to calls of any of the other four species. The reviewer said, I don't believe your data unless you can give me an evolutionary explanation that fits what I want. <laughs> Fortunately, the, the editors had a broader perspective and we got published. But this is totally predictable because, hey, scientists of any stripe are certainly human. Yeah, yeah. Come in back there. Is there a study uh, that shows the percentage of these young folk who th thought seriously they wanted and they didn't? There are those who thought seriously wanted they did and then they didn't want it. And then those who did and didn't want it, but suffered mentally. In other words, how many of these uh, actual percentage, these people are really conflicted? 
Uh, these people I don't use in a pejorative. That term. is the that is the next thing that Lisa Littman is working on is does the phenomena of wanting it and then not wanting it exist um, and are there characteristics of it and then I think once having established that that's the case if indeed it is the case and it sounds like she has anecdotal data that she is already working on then then the next question will be what are the characteristics of these people and how do they fit with the characteristics of of everybody else who has uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria and for that matter childhood gender dysphoria um, I think that uh, those questions really need to be asked and they need to be answered and they need to be answered in a way that does not assume that these people, you know, the real problem is that they're transgender and they're trapped in the wrong body and if we can just fix the body we're fine and you must listen to them at all times and they, they can never be wrong. Um, I, um, the idea of saying cool it, let's see what happens over you know, six months, if you're still that way, maybe we'll, we'll think about it, is a rational way of doing things. Um, but it's not one of the ways that the, uh, that the transgender community usually recommends. Um, and I, regardless of whether, you know, what these people's eternal destiny is or anything of that nature, um, it is probably worthwhile, you know, asking, does this really help? One thing that gives me pause is that Johns Hopkins, which pioneered this surgery, at least I was led to believe that they had stopped it because they had felt more problems existed from doing the surgery than not. Um, which given our current uh, political climate in academia, is a kind of remarkable thing. Um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. And you know, I am for people being comfortable even if, uh, by the way, the mic's coming to you. I am comfortable for people, with people being, doing things that might not be good. I, I at present do not advocate, for example, prohibition. Um, even though I think alcohol does more damage in society than it does good. Um, but, uh, but saying that doesn't mean that I have to say it's right or that it's a good idea for any particular person or for society in general. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing blurred is the line between what's legal and what's right. And I think some of these people, you know, once it's legal, it must be right. I, I can't tell you how many people I've run into who, uh, you know, uh, smoke marijuana. And the first thing they say is, I've got a card. As if that changed it. You know, I'm not asking whether you have a card or not. I'm not asking whether I'm going to throw you in jail or not. I don't report that anyway. That's confidential information. In fact, I think it's illegal for me to report you. Uh, there are only certain things that I can legally report. One of them is if you beat your wife, you know. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but it still has an impact on your health, and I need to know that. And if you're talking and you have COPD, I need to tell you to stop. <laughs> or at least it's a good idea for you to stop. And again, I don't follow them home and make sure that they throw away all their weed. You know, I would have to camp out at their home and make sure they didn't <laughs> buy any more. I mean, it's ridiculous. But, uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to say that it's a good idea. You know, and some of this comes across almost as thought police. Not only will you do what we want, but you will not even think. <laughs> And, 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 and I think that that is the motive behind the idea that this journal, this journal article should be retracted. What they don't realize is 
it's already in the Wayback Machine. You can't unring the bell. And you shouldn't try because it looks like you're being, you know, um, it looks like you're being censorious. <coughs> <clears throat> Maybe that's part of the problem is that they do want to be censorious. I don't know. Anyway. I just remembered some years ago hearing or reading about this phenomenon with deafness. Um, there was some new research that some kind of o cochlear implants were actually having, helping children who had lost their hearing or had been born with, you know. And there was an uproar in some parts of the deaf community, totally opposed to forcing their children to change as if is this, it's not a defect, it's just the way they were born and they, they've lived with it that way and they're happy and they don't want any child that was the way they are tampered with. I, I was just astonished to hear this. And it sounds like a similar concept is at play here as well. It's you know, <laughs> I would agree with you so much. Uh, it, it's a refusal to call something that's, that's damaging damaging because it might hurt somebody's feelings or or you would or the person other person indulging in it feels rebuked or yeah uh, and dissed. the thing of it is i am fine with deaf communities and if they want to use sign language as their exclusive way of talking that's fine with me too i in fact i kind of think that it should be encouraged but if by some miracle or some technological reason, we could give them hearing. They don't want it. Why not? <clears throat> and yeah, I, I sense a need to be normal and don't anybody talk to me about the fact that there's a, a defect. Yeah. Uh, I'm hesitant to raise this. Uh, comment, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, after what uh, some of us have seen happened yesterday uh, in the political world, uh, should this surprise us? Uh, to me, the uh, I, uh, this is a Sabgo class, and uh, I, uh, it is. To, to me, the, uh, the lesson for us here is that we need to put our trust in God, Amen. And not in human beings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To me, that's the only <laughs> solution. Uh, I've, I've never seen such uh, polarization in my life, and uh, sure, maybe I don't remember that well. But uh, you, you were drunk at the time. <laughs> yeah. Even commentators that have um, followed these for years say, "I've never seen anything like this." Yeah, but of course they say that every year. Uh, well, it, it's <laughs> more and more applicable. We're just we're just expanding the window of uh, 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 of behavioral uh, acceptance. <laughs> but uh, to me, the lesson is, I'm so grateful for God, and I put my trust in Him. Yeah, I, I think the one uh, the one thing that I think we need to be very careful about is trying to make political solutions to this. Um, I don't know that we can even uh, make it work, and I'm concerned that if we make it work, we may actually make things worse. Um, if, if somebody else forces everybody to behave like they want and think like they want, um, if we turn around and do it to them, do we wind up not uh, participating in the precise character of what they're doing that we don't like the most? Um, you know, Jesus' words are still valid. Uh, 
whatever you want people to do to you, do that also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. If you want a concise summary of what Christianity is about, it's the golden rule. And that means that we have no business turning around and forcing them to do what we want. But anyway. I won't leap into the political debate at this time. <laughs> but my lifelong interest has been the debate. And there is a debate between science and religion. And oftentimes it boils down to um, a categorization that's a miscategorization, and that's that science is rational and religion is irrational, right? Science, you can, you can be objective. Religion, it's very subjective and very personal and all of that. Another characterization is that Science, you lay aside your feelings as a scientist, and you work in the lab, and your own personal psyche and your biases are all laid aside. <laughs> Whereas in religion, it's entirely biased. I think if we apply those characterizations to what we're seeing here the last two weeks, it it's going to be very illuminating. It, 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 more closely re resembles religion than science if those are the definitions. Yeah. So I'll expand this a little bit further. This idea of euphoria. Um, boy, we've seen a lot of euphoria and uh, excitement about different findings. Uh, the euphoria can be fostered like uh, a wildfire, you know, it gets started, it burns uncontrolled, and that's what we're seeing on these university campuses without saying much more about that. I just want to <clears throat> throw a question like throwing the cat among the pigeons. Since the Pacific Union has decided that we will not ordain based on gender, does that mean we can now ordain transgender? I don't want to go anywhere with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, tr the, the truth of the matter is that I think that at a certain point we should be um, not only accepting but supportive. If somebody has gone to the point to where they've actually had surgery to change the anatomy, um, I'm willing to call the person who started out a male as a female at that point, and I'm willing to call the person who started out as a female a male. To me, it's a very practical division, you know. Um, but they haven't changed their genetics in any way. They haven't changed the chromosomes. True, they true. They're still what they started out as. They may have uh, <coughs> changed no, and, and, outside, and you, and but And you're not right. Inside. You're right that a transgender female is not the same as a as one that is born that way. Um, I'm a little bit careful about that because uh, there are XY people who do not have the testosterone receptor and who grow up female, including vagina, breasts, um, everything you could want except a uterus and ovaries. And interestingly enough, their testes don't descend and they have to be removed because when they're constantly at body temperature, they're more likely to develop testicular cancer. Um, and they don't have periods because they don't have a uterus and they can't have children because they don't have a uterus. But they're in every, I mean, if you look at them, uh, until you do a, a swab of some kind, you don't know that they're, fe that they're male. Um, and for those people, they really should be um, put into society as females, I think. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, I, think that, I think that the idea that, that trans people are, you know, doing something weird 
You know, the place I have a trouble is that somebody who claims to be a woman gets into the women's bathroom and then, uh, especially, if, especially if it's open, you know, or, or goes into the female locker rooms and then showers with, uh, let's say, equipment different from the, the rest of the girls. I, I, I have a little difficulty with that. And I think that if that continues on, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna have to have private shower stalls for everybody. Uh, it's, you know, the communal stuff is not gonna work. Uh, and, I, uh, and so, you know, like I say, once you've done the surgery, I, you know, I will take the best of what I would consider a bad situation, but, uh, you know, uh, whether it helps that particular person, I don't know. Um, but I mean, once you're there, you're kind of there. But on the other hand, you know, the, the, the half transitions, and, and maybe one of the solutions should be that we have more single restrooms. And then it doesn't matter. Yeah. Or the family one. Or the family one. Which target has? They, they have opened the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the pretense that what you feel like is what you are, regardless of, of what kind of interactions you could have with anybody else, uh, I would label as a pretense and minor, minor difficulties and if uh, anybody tries anything, you're talking about major difficulties. And at, very, at the very least, I think that, uh, that women, for example, should not have to go into a restroom uh, or, or, or a shower facility and then have people with penises in there who claim to be women. I mean, that's just not, that's not fair for them. Now, you know, if the women want it that way, that's, that's their business. But I don't think women should be uh, societally forced to do that. Speaking as one who has no personal faults of my own, <laughs> is, not, is, is not a transgender person still a person? Yes. And deserves every rights and considerations? Yes. And, and, and in fact, I would go further. I would say a person for whom Christ died as a person, but do you want a transgendered male with your six-year-old girl in the female bathroom? Well, and, let's put it this way. Target has a law that says you have to do that. They're allowed. No, they're allowed. Men are allowed to be in your bathroom. And the same way in schools, you cannot prevent kids. They walk into a school in California and they say, I'm a girl. They ha you have to let them go into the girl's bathroom. Yeah, well, that, that's why I say that. The easiest way to solve this whole problem, and it will solve the embarrassment problem and everything, is to just have single bathrooms and single, um, single stall. a, a shower stalls. And in that way, you know, uh, you don't have to bother with anybody. And you don't have to worry about what anybody's going to do to you. And, you know, let's not forget that, um, that we have a problem of sexual predators who who, uh, men who prey on men, so you still have that, or, or boys, you still have that problem. Um, and again, uh, you know, I, and I think it's fair for us to say also that, uh, that there, are, there are medical problems involved. Um, and that saying so is not being anti-transgender, if anything, it's being pro-humanity, do you want to think about this before you, before you go ahead and get the surgery? And somebody who is now trans, I'm accepting. I mean, fully trans. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're going to live just as long as I do on, on average. You know, and let's not try to pretend otherwise. Because they are susceptible to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, some of the side effects that were listed, you know. I am presently walking this painful path with a friend um, 
whose son in the fifth grade decided there was no God, who is autistic, and who has notified his parents that he's changing his name, which he did. Um, we pray for him, her. We, we'll see. I mean, maybe there will be a change. He, he's been married for five years. They divorced. Um, but his mother said it's, it's not too surprising for the fact that he's always been with his autism a little bit on the outside looking in, and if he's decided a long time ago there is no God, you know, he, he, he was vulnerable, and he lives in San Francisco. So, yeah. yeah. It, it seems to me that one of the issues here is the lack of information, and at what age do you assume a child or even a teenager um, is able to digest and assess what the issue is. So if the parents, because there seems to be a criticism of um, this piece of research, in part because the parents were being listened to, and they might have hidden uh, agendas for their children. But if the parents aren't there, does the state or the academics or the mass uh, aggressive gangs feel they have a right to dictate what information the child is given at what information or what age is the child allowed to make decisions which I mean in some cases are permanent and one thing to keep in mind with that is that it's one thing to say this is the age at which they should but nowadays with the internet a lot of times that um, our pronouncements about that age don't mean a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, on the internet, there could be, uh, like there is on cigarette boxes, a compulsion to put a warning. This information is given by people who have a hidden agenda and who may not actually favor you. And, and you know, I don't know if the kids would pay any attention, but... <laughs> Some of them would feel that that means that they need to pay more attention. Uh, th that's part of the problem. So throw out your TVs and your internets from your children until they're 22 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and if you do it that way, then what happens to when your kids turn 22? They suddenly spring out of the box and uh, go wild. We used to watch that in, in Newball College when American kids came there. For the first time they were free. <laughs> and their misbehavior was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, have the freedom progressively like most of the Europeans have. They've been in an academy, they've been in a yeah. church, this and that. When they came to New Bowl, they didn't know how to deal with freedom. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with that. That happens. I, I disagree. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking from a European perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to go way off topic in a way, but. <clears throat> After a decade as dean of dean of research with the IRB reporting to me, I'm not surprised by very much. Uh, I, I remember one particular study by a couple of sophisticated researchers they were proposing wanted to evaluate whether or not the kind of music they play during uh, appeals for conversion uh, had any effect and the model they chose was to give students a 20 question quiz and have some take it with the music and some without the quiz wasn't really relevant to the topic <laughs> when we said this doesn't make sense we had to go all the way to the president to to keep them uh, t to finally get them to be quiet because we had been unjustly critical of the research and we had taken a position that we didn't do human-based research which didn't have a clear reason for doing in terms of getting defensible outcomes Although the amazing thing was that these people were sophisticated researchers so 
the problem in all of this is spelled H-U-M-A-N. Yes, <laughs> yes. I taught in a large high school, 3,200 children, young adults. It was uh, high school. And uh, before all of this has become popularized, it's the only way I can say it, we had two trans kids. And dealing with the uh, bathroom issue was a real thing. Uh, one of the kids uh, I encouraged to come into my classroom so that they'd have what I considered a safe place to go if they needed. Um, he also, well she also, uh, decided she would come to school uh, dressed as female, made up as female, and uh, at that time, we didn't have a bathroom for her. And uh, she w went into the boys' bathroom and got nearly uh, beat to death. Did, uh, did not show up again at school. This is public school? This is public schools. And uh, from having her in our school, uh, we, uh, th well, the faculty and administration, uh, we decided that the bathrooms for the faculty in the office, which were single bathrooms, were the ones that were designated for cases we didn't know what to do with. For example, we had a little girl that had spina bifida who was wheelchair bound but she needed a bathroom. So uh, they designated the, you know, our bathroom, the women's bathroom, that, that she should use that. Had they done that for this kid, um, perhaps he would have come back, the, she would have come back the yeah. next year. But I mean, she was nearly beat to death. Yeah. And uh, I have found that as far as accepting differences in people, the girls are much, much more tolerant than the boys. The boys are total homophobes. Even when you have discussion with them about the non-receptors uh, on, on the guy's bodies, they don't work. You know, you try to explain, it's like the main switch. And if that doesn't get turned on, it goes to default, which is the female. It's just like albi albinism. If that first switch doesn't turn on, then you're an albino. If the first switch turns on and then some of the others don't, then you have and then, yeah, so, but uh, yeah. it, it was, it really upset me because this kid didn't bother anybody. And I think that that's an important point to make while we're discussing this, is that some of these people have been terribly traumatized. And it is not fair to try to make them understand a rational conversation when their background is and all the, you know, they, they beat me up. And well, if they don't beat me up, then they kind of say, well, he, she, whatever, had it coming. And, uh, and so, and so, yeah. Than the well, and 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 uh, of course, you know, eventually, what they want is total, complete acceptance, not only of them but what they're doing, and that's kind of hard to do. But I think that we have to at least have some kind of acceptance, as long as they're not directly bothering other people. 
And that's one of the reasons why I think that the wave of the future is going to be small bathrooms. I think that the idea of communal bathrooms is going to go eventually, going to go the way of the dodo. Well, sometimes the reason that they want them in the female bathrooms is because they do have stalls. Um, yeah. You know, and if they're, he, uh, she was very um, proactively female is how I will put that and uh, see the boys restrooms did not have as many stalls and blah 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 but because we were overpopulated our school was built for like 1800 students the girls lined up outside the bathroom anyway they they kept bringing in students and bringing in students but there were not facilities for them. So when my classroom was right beside the girls bathroom so when my girls came into my class they had privileges that the boys didn't because you could go out in the hallway and check and there were 20 girls in line. How you know and so the boys objected but I said the girls have needs that you don't have. When you get those needs, then you can, I'll let you go in my classroom also. <laughs> Girls had priorities. Well, anyway, next week we'll be talking about um, I, the book, uh, what? Zombies. zombies, that's right. Next week we'll be talking about zombies. Scientific zombies.